I'm Will Leviste. He's Eric Laville. And you're tuned into Leviste and Claville, telling it to you straight the way it is from a black male perspective. Let's get right to it. Today's show, COVID-19 and Black America. Now, the COVID-19 global pandemic has killed many worldwide, and Black people and brown people and indigenous people have been dying at much higher rates. Um, now we have a vaccine, and the vaccine issue is one where even uh, folks in our community have a legitimate concern, a legitimate distrust of government and health institutions so there's a wariness about taking a vaccine. So black health professionals from the National Academy of Health just recently wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. And we're honored to have Dr. Thomas Levice, who's a dean of the School of Public Health at Tulane University. And yeah, you'll recognize the last names are similar. So um, I'm the baby brother. But Dr. Levice, <laughs> appreciate having you here with the uh, Claville, along with uh, Claville on our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. You may be the baby brother, but I'm the more handsome brother. Yeah, I know. You always say that, but, uh, but we're going to let the ladies judge. Eric, we're going to let the ladies judge when they see this, man. We're going to let, let them judge. I know I know that's what Bridget said, your wife, you know, but... This well, is a sibling rivalry here. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stay out of it. <laughs> and, and that's the only opinion that matters. Right. Yeah. You know, Janet's going to say different, but, you know, on a serious matter, with the vaccines in place, like I said, now we got this wariness about people taking the vaccine. That's the that's the impetus behind why you wrote the letter. Talk about the op-ed piece that you got the health professionals to write. Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show and, and for giving me the opportunity to to address this important problem. So what what we've um, what we anticipated actually was that there was going to be some inequities in the distribution of the vaccine. And we've been trying to get on, stay on top of that and address the inequities. But one of the issues that we knew uh, was going to be ha going to be a problem was this issue of vaccine hesitancy. Polls had been showing through much of uh, 2020 that African Americans were distrustful of the vaccine and was concerned about potential long-term health implications of being vaccinated. And we anticipated there was going to be a problem, so we've been trying to work on messaging and educating the community so that they understand how the vaccine was produced and, and why it is safe and effective. You know, uh, Tom, if I can ask this, you know, we've one thing that the pandemic has done, it is I'll pull the covers back on all inequities pretty much in our society, from healthcare, education, food insecurity, employment insecurity, and, and the like. And one thing that I saw in the medical community is that it pulled the covers back on the discrimination and the biases all, that always existed. You know, as black people, we've always said we're not treated uh, uh, the same as whites when we go into the hospital. Our doctors are not trusting us to tell us, uh, for, for us to tell them what's going on with us. Has that been taken into consideration when looking at not just the efficacy of this vaccine, but also the trust level that African-Americans have with doctors in general and also medicine, you know, because again, we talk about the Tuskegee experiment. We talk about the uh, Mississippi Delta uh, uh, project with sterilized women, forced sterilization and, and, and the like. What type of conversations have there, have there been around that, those issues? Well, there certainly have been a lot of conversations. You know, we've been on this issue uh, for decades back in the 1980s, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 1985 published a report called the Secretary's Report on Black and Minority Health, uh, also referred to as the Heckler Report. And what the Heckler Report showed was a 13-volume report, and it showed chart after chart after chart documenting that the, we had massive disparities across every disease category, infectious disease, chronic diseases, injuries, accidents, you name it. We had a higher rate uh, for African Americans and indigenous people. Uh, uh, populations as well as Hispanics, and so there's been there's been efforts um, to address that issue at least since that time. So I don't want to pretend that there hasn't been that. And over the last you know four decades or so, there's been a real uh, development of an infrastructure now within uh, public health nationally, within the government, 
many foundations have really taken up this banner, banner as its um, as its primary um, focus area. Foundations such as Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and um, and and in the academic public health world and medical world, you know there are research centers and a lot of uh, scholars now that are focusing on this issue. So while I think it would be accurate to say that the racial disparities issue really wasn't getting much attention before the 1980s, I would say after the 80s, there's been a lot more attention to it. Doesn't mean we resolved the problem. Right. But there is now a lot more discussion about it and a lot more efforts to address it that's been happening. You know, what's, what's interesting, you talk about racial disparities, even with the vaccines, there's been a disparity of getting the vaccine in communities, in black and brown communities. What's been the reaction to your to the op-ed and has that had any positive effect and people been paying, paying attention to that? Right, so before I talk about the op-ed, can I give get a little bit, I think an impo- important background that I think is is necessary for to understand sure, go the, ahead. the question you asked. So, so as far as the, the issue of there being a, a disparity in the vaccine, I, I wanna, um, you didn't mention this in the introduction, so I wanted to just, just for your audience to know that in addition to being dean of the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine at Tulane, I'm also the co-chair of the Louisiana Governor's Task Force on COVID-19 and Health Equity. So I'm, I'm also working with the state and helping to, you know, de- develop policy around how we distribute this vaccine. In other words, you're on the front and, lines of this whole issue. You're right on the front line. Well, for, I guess you could say from that standpoint, mm-hmm. I'm not on the front line in that I'm not seeing patients, but I'm on the front line in terms of policy making right. and ha- trying to, to help figure out how we get this vaccine distributed. Um, and so we, uh, the CDC recommended a process uh, for who gets vaccinated in what order. And right now we are still in what CDC calls tier 1B. Mm-hmm. In tier mm-hmm. 1A and B, we basically it was nursing home residents, nursing home staff, um, medical professionals on the front line, or healthcare professionals on the front line, people like that. Now we've included allied health as well, and other people that are, as you would refer to it, as on the front line. So it's the vaccine is not yet available for everybody, unless you are over age 65 or in one of those categories. You know, so, so when, so in Louisiana, uh, 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 African Americans are 32 percent of the population, and the la- last data we have shows that there's 12 percent of the vaccines have gone to African Americans in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And you can look at that comparison and say, "Wow, it's 32 percent of the population, but it's only 12 percent vaccinated." But that really is not the, tr- the the correct comparison. It's not to comp- you don't compare it back to the total population of the state. Right. You can compare that back to the percentage of African Americans in those categories that are eligible. So what's, what percentage now, do they represent in that category? Right, exactly. No, right. That's a good, good question. So now when I did a little, a little digging to try to get some statistics on that, mm-hmm. it's somewhere around 23% mm-hmm. of, the, of the state's population it, it, that are eligible are African-American. So clearly, clearly there's still a disparity. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to even begin to pretend that there isn't one. There is a problem here. But I'm saying the problem is not of the magnitude as it might uh, seen, and I do. I've seen it in the media a lot. That kind of comparison back to the full population, which is not really accurate. Now, how do, if, I'm if, sorry. If I could, I mean, what what is the underlying reason, you know, for that disparity? I mean, obviously, we know where people live. We know where they go to get health care, right. whether it's a primary care physician or the emergency room. But in, in that population, it's most of the people are Medicare eligible or their own Medicare. So, you know, it, it's not hard to locate who they are <laughs> and, and where they go. I mean, so what's really the issue? Why aren't African-Americans getting the vaccine in that in that tier like they really should? OK, so now it's I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give quick answers, but it's not a quick answer to that question. <laughs> well, we got time. So, you got like, time. We got time. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and I really and I really do want to explain it, because I think what happens a lot when we get in the media is we don't have an opportunity to really explain things. And then we give these quick answers and then people don't really get it. Right. So there are three reasons for the disparity in vaccinations to this point. OK, so one reason is. There is, we simply don't have enough vaccine. We just don't have enough doses to, to meet the need right now. 
I mean, so we, we create these these mass acts, uh, mass um, these mass vaccination events. We think we're going to have I don't know ten thousand doses at a particular event, uh, and then when the doses actually come, it's not as many as we thought. So we had planned for ten thousand people to come, but now we only got enough to vaccinate eight thousand people, and so there's going to be two thousand people that are going to be disappointed, upset, and that's going to fuel even more distrust, right? So that's the that's one issue. Right. Just, there just isn't enough vaccine. The second issue is um, we is that you know the country is dramatically racially segregated, right? And so we don't live in the same communities. And if you just go through the process, uh, a normal process of just delivering the vaccine through so through uh, organizations and facilities that you normally would use, hospitals, clinics, you know, uh, pharmacies. Doc, uh, medical uh, uh, offices, these facilities are not distributed evenly throughout the country. So if we use that process, you can predict you're going to have inequities, right? Because they're just not in every community. There are medical deserts all over this country, and they are disproportionately black and brown communities. So in Louisiana, we actually did model that. So we actually, we, 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 we modeled out what are the communities that are, um, you know, there's a there's a statistic that CDC creates called social vulnerability. For it's measuring the, the the vulnerability of a community based on its characteristics. So we map social vulnerability against doctors' offices, hospitals, and clinics. Then we made a map, and you could clearly see if we just follow it, that that process of using the existing medical care infrastructure, there's going to be huge portions of the state right. that are not going to be covered. Right. So we, we saw that, we predicted that, and then we started to develop relationships with like supermarkets and other types of, you know, churches, other types of organizations so that we can try to expa expand um, the, uh, the access, the, you know, yeah, access in that way. So if you're, if you're modeling it out, if you're thinking ahead and you're saying, okay, if we do things in the most simple, logical way, what's the outcome? then you can see that. So now the next structural issue to getting it into some of these communities is that the Pfizer vaccine has to be kept at negative 70 degrees. The Moderna vaccine doesn't have to be kept at negative 70 degrees, but it has to be kept at uh, frozen until it's used. Once you thaw out the Pfizer vaccine, you've got six hours to get that vaccine to somebody's arm. So now imagine this, first of all, you're going to have to get that frozen vaccine out into the hinterlands, right, into some of the rural areas, which is already a challenge because communities, not every community even has a sub-70 degree freezer in the entire city, right? right? So, so that you got to get it there. Once you've thought it out, you got six hours. And, if, and, and, you know, the worst possible thing would be to waste vaccine when it's already in short supply. So what's the logistics around how you get that vaccine to that community and get it into somebody's arm before it expires? Very, very challenging, right? But now once you've gotten past those structural issues, not enough vaccine, right. facilities not located where they need to be located, logistical problems getting the vaccine to where you need it, now you've got this last issue, which is vaccine hesitancy where people are just mistrustful and not willing to accept the vaccine, even when it's offered to them. And that is a problem that, that we've been trying to contend with. So, you know, you, you basically outline a lot of hurdles that we have in ensuring that this vaccine gets out to where it needs to go. But you mentioned, I, I, I want us to talk about quickly the mistrust. So we talk about the mistrust of this vaccine, right? Now, We've never seen a vaccine develop this quickly. And I know, I know, you know, I paid attention to the research with Dr. Fauci and his team as they discuss how they've taken the research down to, uh, to this particular level to where they can isolate this particular spike uh, protein. They can isolate this part of, of, of the flu. Uh, 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 virus, and they could basically target uh, where the vaccine needs to go. But let's be honest here. You know, there's not been a test group for this vaccine. <laughs> so the people who are getting the vaccine, are they the test group for 
any side effects and the things that are going to happen, not just initially, but down the road? Uh, I don't know about that. The, the vaccines have been have been tested before they even are allowed to uh, be put out to the public. So, you know, that's, but that's, I, I mean, that's the that's the scientific method and, and process. I, I mean, Tom, you could explain that, right? I mean, yeah, but will I mean, usually testing takes takes place over years. Uh, there were individuals that were given this test, and the they were monitored over months, not years. And so, th- does that have an it, it, does that play into the mind? Well, first of all, I know people are asking questions, saying that, hey, you know, we haven't seen this thing tested long enough. Yeah. Eric, I, yeah, Eric, I, I'm, I would love to answer this question. I've, I've been waiting to answer this question. Okay. Because I think that I think that this is, I think that this is the biggest issue with vaccine hes- hesitancy right now. So in the past, vaccines would take more than ten years yeah. to produce. Right. This time, we produced a vaccine in ten months. Right. So how is that possible? Right. And I think the fact that um, the previous administration, um, I think, did not communicate well enough on this issue. And this question is still out there. So well, now here's- the past communication didn't communicate at all. So let's start from ground zero. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but it was created during the previous administration. Right. They had this, op- this program they called Operation Warp Speed. Yep which was a partnership with federal government and uh, pharmaceutical companies and universities to, um, to produce the vaccine, right? So first of all, calling it Operation Warp Speed was, a, was an unfortunate decision, right? Because calling it that focused on the speed that was, that, uh, in which it was being developed rather than focusing on the care okay. that was being taken, right? So they maybe should, they should have called it Operations f- fast, but but really, really, you know, careful, you know, or something like something like that. But that was the first problem. And then they didn't explain to people why they were able to create a vaccine in five in ten years. So here's how it's possible to do it. First of all, there are new technologies that have been developed in just the last decade or so that didn't exist when we were battling polio and influenza and these other other diseases. So just the the ability to create vaccines faster just is um, is much better now simply because we've got new technologies that didn't previously exist that allow us to create these vaccines much more quickly. Okay. Second of all, you had teams all over the world working on the same problem at the same time. You never have teams in, I don't know, 20, 30 different countries, multiple teams working on the same problem like this. So you've never had this kind of mobilization of medical scientists working on a vaccine at the same time. You also had a dramatic infusion of funds from the federal government that you usually don't have. So typically the way it works is I want to create a vaccine. I write a grant application to NIH. It takes a best case scenario. It takes nine months before that application leads to me having actual dollars I can use. And that's if I'm lucky enough to get funded on my first application, right? right? right. So that's right. like best case scenario, I'm a year in before I can even start the research on this vaccine. Then I do the research over the next three to five years, and then I've now de- I've learned what I've learned. Like, let's say we've created the vaccine. So now I'm ready, and this is like, and what I'm describing to you is the best case scenario. So now I'm ready to apply for um, for FDA approval. I apply, I, I submit the application, which can take months to even write. You submit that application, and then it sits on somebody's desk for a, a month or two until they finally sign off and pass it on to the next uh, bureaucrat that it sits on their desk for a while, and then it passes on to the next, and then it finally goes through that entire process until it gets to the point where FDA is ready to say it's approved. Now, that was, and with the, the example I just gave you was like a best case possible scenario. And we're already like practically 10 years in just on that scenario. Mm. This time things were done. And then then once we've got the approval, now I've got to license this vaccine to a pharmaceutical company, which can take who knows how long to negotiate that license. And then they got to start manufacturing because they're not going to start putting the money into manufacturing until they've done all the tests, we've gone through the three different levels of, tr- of trials, which I'm happy to describe them for you. And then, so now this is why it takes 10 years if, if, I, if we go through that process. So what was done differently? First of all, you had new technology that sped up the process. 
Second of all, you had um, multiple teams and people would, and things were being done sequentially. So instead of waiting until step one was over before you started step two, they did them at the same time. They began manufacturing the vaccine before it had already been demonstrated that it worked, which is very risky, right? Because if it didn't work, they'd have to destroy all that vaccine and all of that money would have been wasted. Now, fortunately, it did work. So they you know, were able to move more quickly. So it's not that any corners were cut. The same process was used as is always used. Things were done, ex- was expedited. FDA didn't sit on their hands for, right. you know, months at a time at each step. As you can see, the um, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, just applied for emergency use authorization last week, yeah. and they've already uh, going to be reviewed next week, right, two weeks, right? So we'll have Johnson & Johnson will have been approved, if it gets approved, in just two weeks after getting its application. Unprecedented. Normally, that would be probably more like two years. Yeah. So. That's why it was done so quickly, and it's not because they cut corners, because they still went through the same trials. Yeah, and, and, one and that's the and that's the thing I want to point out is that cutting cor- is a difference between cutting corners and being efficient. So now, when you be efficient, which is what we're always calling for, the more efficiencies, because the process that you just outlined just shows there's a whole lot of inefficiency in that, and uh, uh, a proposal, a test sitting on somebody's desk. So now we've gotten more efficient use it, uh, technology. So now everybody wants to equate that with, with cutting corners. And it's not necessarily about cutting corners because because the, uh, you know, the FDA, all of the other uh, bodies wouldn't have done and wouldn't have done the approvals unless they had the, uh, the, the, the ability to legitimately do the approval, which takes us to another issue about the misinformation. And how people use these scenarios, the distrust that already exists in the black community as a reason to advance their agenda, which is to be anti-vax, you know, against vaccines altogether. And, I, you know, I wanted your take on that, Tom, with, you know, all of this misinformation and this anti-vax movement that really has its own agenda that in many ways is about selling products, is about moving people in other directions and how that is having an effect on our community. But Will, before you go there, uh, Tom, I mean, basically communicating what you just communicated, I, I remember, you know, listening to that, uh, learning about that process, and I, I understand it. But I think the point that, every, that uh, a lot of people are looking at is that though it was developed with new technology, which allowed us to be more efficient as opposed to cutting corners, there haven't been any results as to the effect of this vaccine and to the side effects of the vaccine itself. Because usually we get we get tests and you see these various side effects and the like. So I think that's that's some of the fear and trepidation that a lot of people have as it relates to that. Well, that, that, even that's not really th- true. So we still the, the vaccine still went through all all phases. And every time a new drug is developed, there is, you don't hear about it in the media very much. And I think this is another part of the problem, that every step of what happened throughout this entire pandemic happened in the media. Mm. And so the, the way that scientists think, this is how we think. Okay, Eric Clavel does a study and he has a finding. And we say, oh, okay, that's what we now believe is true. Then Will Levis does another study and says, well, there's a little nuance here to what Eric found, and it's not exactly right. Then we say, oh, okay, we thought that was true. Now we know that's not true. Now we believe what Will said. And then Joe Smith comes along, does another study and says, no, 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 they were both wrong. This is really what it is because they didn't consider this other factor. And then we all go, oh, okay, this is not what we believe. Right. That's the that's the sausage-making in, in developing scientific consensus. Scientific method, right. And, and that's how we're used to approaching it. And that's how we're used right. to seeing it. And so it's not a, it's to us, it's not a shock that, oh, well, we thought this, and now there's this new great study that was really well done, and it demonstrates that, no, that we, there was what we thought isn't really right. And then we all just say, okay, well, somebody replicate that study, and once you've been able to show that this new study is really accurate, we now change our opinions. That doesn't normally happen in the media. So it's happening in scientific meetings. It's happening where we're having discussions. And 
it's a it's a troubling process to see sausage being made. And right now, that's what's happening. The public is seeing the sausage made, yeah. and the public is not used to, okay, they said this one day, and now they're saying that the next day. And I'm like, well, that's the normal process. Right. Us, and I can tell you, it's not- right, and I can tell you, and that's why my reaction is what it is, because I can tell you that in, as a journalist, there are the public pundit journalists and then there is the science and health journalists. The science and health journalists understand exactly what Tom just said. It's the pundit, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, the people who want quick answers and don't understand the scientific method. And, and like he said earlier, they've only got 10 minutes to do this interview and they're looking for a simple answer to bring to the public. But if you if you followed it and you followed the science journalists, and a health journalist, they're saying exactly what Tom just said. But we don't often get that in the public media, which brings us to the vaccine issue, which the which the public journalists should really be dealing with head on and really investigating and saying, what is going on here with this anti-vax and these quick answers? And what is really these people's agenda when they're trying to get everybody to not engage vaccines at all. So, I mean, Tom, what is, what is your take on that and how you yeah, all are I, having to battle that? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think that the, I think that, you know, you, you really need long form journalism. You need shows like this to really get into this issue because it's too complex. So even when I was on, I was on MS, MSNBC the other night, the other day, and I, I tried to squeeze in as much of what I just said as I could in that short segment but it's hard to really lay it out and explain to people. And people really need to understand, once you explain how the vaccine was created so fast, people can understand it. There's nothing so complicated about it that they can't get it. But you don't have the, you don't get the time in the media usually to explain that to people so people could understand, oh, now I understand how he did it so fast. Now, I did want to make one more question, one response to, to Eric's question about the, the length of the trials. So once you get past phase three, which is what everyone here has been hearing about, phase three tests, phase three trials, um, there is a phase four, which doesn't get media attention. But phase four is that, okay, we've now done this phase three trials. Usually phase three trials are done on 25,000 or more people. In this case, they were all done on 30,000 or more. All, All three of the vaccines were done on large groups of people, and that's typical. Now, that's, that's, that's standard. That's the way it's, it's supposed to be done. Now, if you have a, um, a, a side effect that has an extremely low rate, I don't know, one, one tenth of one percent, you know, out of 30,000 people, you might not have a single person or let's say even less than let's say one half of, of, of that. You know, you, uh, you, you, won't, you, may, you may not have a single person that gets that side effect because it's so rare, and even 30,000 is not enough people to pick up that, that side effect. But now, once you deploy that vaccine on 330 million people, that extremely rare side effect could lead to two or three deaths, which would have been such an infinitesimal percentage that it would never have come out in phase three. But then you see it in phase four. That has happened in the past. With, with some other uh, drugs. Um, so you continue to monitor people. So the people that are in phase three are still being followed today, even though the vaccine is being used. And now there's phase four monitoring happening as it's been deployed and we're you know, monitoring people to see what's going on. And I can tell you so far, the deployment of this vaccine in terms of its risk profile is extremely good. I mean, you're talking about a handful of people that did have allergic reactions to it. I mean, we're talking like less than 10 people around the country that had allergic reactions. Um, And we've got uh, the last data I saw, we were uh, nearing like 10%, no, what was it? um, uh, 5% of the population that has received at least one dose. So, I'd say this is an, a massively successful vaccine as far as a safety and efficacy profile. Now, Tom, I have I have one last question because I know you got an exciting new project that we want to delve into. From your from your standpoint, your viewpoint, in knowing the creating the policy behind this, understanding the science, the supply issues that we have, what is your estimate? Do you believe that we'll have enough vaccines? 
in order for the entire country to be vaccinated, should they choose to. And not just the enough vaccines, but then the supply, the logistic hurdles to actually get it into the arms and the systems of our people. Because ultimately, I think we all want to go back to normal, right? And I, I guess as a follow-up, is it possible that we can go back to normal uh, after the vaccine? I think there'll be a new normal. I think that we're going to live, wow. we're going to have to learn to coexist with COVID now, the way that we've had to learn to coexist with influenza. Uh, influenza killed um, millions and millions of people a hundred years ago, but today we think of it as just a little thing. Oh, it's just, just the flu, right? Um, but it, it's a very deadly disease that kills tens of thousands of people, even still in this country every year. Um, we're going to have to learn to live with COVID. Um, I think it's going to be here. There are new strains of this uh, uh, virus that are now circulating in the country. Um, and just as it's the same thing with influenza, we have multiple strains of influenza that we have to account uh, for. And we're going to have a similar experience going forward. That, that will be the new normal. Um, now, when will we get to the point where everyone can be vaccinated? So we we have had uh, just in the first weeks of the Biden administration, they've already ramped up production. You know, we just got reports just two days ago that they now believe they'll have 20, 200 million more doses than they thought they would be able to have. Uh, we do believe that it's possible that we could get through the pop through the entire U.S. population by uh, July of this year. Now that's now that's that's but that's that's, 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 that's offering the vaccine to people, right? We can offer it to people, but people have to agree to accept it. And that is another challenge because we are finding um, that the uptake of the vaccine is not good enough for us to get to what we call herd immunity. You're tuned in to Claville and Lavise at clavilleandlavise.com. And we're here with uh, Dr. Thomas Lavise, who's the Dean of Public Health at uh, Tulane University, talking about COVID in Black America and also health disparities in general. Uh, Tom, you're the Skin You're In project. It's a multimedia project, includes a book, it's a docu-film series. You actually began this several years ago to address the issue of uh, Black health disparities and why African-Americans live sicker, die younger than other groups in the nation. Talk about that project, you know, in the context of what we're experiencing now. I mean, it's a project that I think, you know, the, the, as you know, I've been working on for, for several years now um, to address this issue of racial disparities in health. You know, COVID is just the, the latest example, but we've had these dis disparities by race for as long as we've had the ability to collect data and see what, what the disparities are. So, you know, we've been trying to, to, to um, uh, learn about why the disparities exist and what we can do to address them. And that's what I've been doing over the last few decades. And the idea behind the skin you're in was to develop a project where we can communicate to the general public. So get out of that, you know, the conversation with other research scientists and move out to the general public and communicate to people what we have learned over the last few decades about these disparities and what people, you know, need to know to be able to take care of their health and live longer and more healthy lives. And so it's a docufilm. It's also a book. Right, that you're working on. It's a multimedia website, tsyi.org. Um, a lot of the reason, as well, I mentioned in the previous segment, you have this battle of information and misinformation going on, particularly with a lot of the anti vax actors out there. I mean, talk about that. And particularly, you see that on the internet. It's got to be frustrating for you to see how a lot of this misinformation is targeting our people. Well, it's, it's frustrating, but as someone who's in this battle, you know, I can't really let myself get frustrated. I have to keep battling. It's just not new. I mean, we've got, uh, we've had false information uh, promoted to the black community about all sorts of things, about the health effects of cigarettes. You know, menthol cigarettes are healthier. Well, in fact, it's the complete opposite, right? As they were being marketed to black people, you know, um, fake and false information about diabetes. You know, diabetes runs in the family. No, diabetes runs, uh, type 2 diabetes runs in the behavior, you know, and what you're eating and how, and how you're taking care of yourself. So there's been a lot of, you know, misinformation and there's a lot of um, uh, mistrust that makes it even more possible for the misinformation to seep into the community. But the mistrust comes from a real place. It comes from 
you know, untrustworthy behavior that people have been exposed to over the decades and even centuries in this country that make African Americans mistrustful. You know, Tom, you you know, you you mentioned something that just made my mind go back uh, a couple of decades. Um, when you talked about the misinformation about a healthier cigarette, you know, again, to me, that's a dichotomy within itself. You know, smoking, nic- you know, the way that we manufacture cigarettes is not healthy at all. You know, our lungs are not meant to have smoke in, in it of no form. You know, so when we talk about the, you mentioned the disparities in African-American health and Black communities, which we know for decades. And, you know, if you go to your, if, if our audience goes to your website, lovies.com, we'll, you'll see uh, tons of your articles, your books that you've written uh, to push this narrative out to educate the public, which I think is phenomenal. But if we know that these disparities exist, and we know that this, inf- this misinformation is out there, then why would our society push these products, these deadly products, into the black community uh, who's already struggling? It's profitable. You know, again, it's you know, profitable. <laughs> well, 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 Will, I mean, look, we understand it is money, but Death I want to hear from destruction is profitable. Right? Therefore, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just to see how, how they drape, uh, you know, this, 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 this logic and moving forward. But, but Tom, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, we know that malt liquor is terrible. We know that menthol cigarettes are absolutely terrible. You know, we know that, you know, all the worst parts of the pig that's put into our grocery stores is bad for your health. But we still push it. I mean, what is the reasoning behind this? Well, I mean, I think clearly there is a profit motive behind it. I mean, some of the... Think about pharma- Think about pharmacy chains that sell cigarettes. <laughs> what, talk, <laughs> about, talk about an oxymoron. Talk about a contradiction. Oxymoron. Right. Mm-hmm. Take your pick. Take yeah. Your- <laughs> actually, actually, it's the CVS. I think stopped maybe what five years ago. You know, CVS now refuses to sell cigarettes, and they should be credited for that. They sold them for many years. But CVS yeah. now does not sell cigarettes because it's a, it's you know, a pharmacy is supposed to be part of the healthcare infrastructure. But they're, but they're selling cigarettes. Now they do still sell potato chips and uh, sh- hot, you know, uh, uh, sugary drinks and all sorts of hey, other. Hey, moderation, other moderation. It's okay. But think, yeah. <laughs> but think about it. It's about it, it's about the profit motive, and you know, profit comes um, when when profit, you know, comes up against health. Health usually loses. How? What has been the reaction so far? You know, one of the things with the skin you're in that project. Um, you know, we had an opportunity because I've, I've been a uh, producer in a project. Tom is the executive producer. Uh, we've had a great opportunity to go around the country and meet with people who are not just sitting back and doing nothing about this, but actually getting out. I remember um, a sister down in, what was that? I was in Tennessee, Nashville, who was going around. We filmed with her going around uh, doing CPR on the spot in the neighborhood in in bars. I mean, talk about talk about that sister. I'm forgetting her name right now. Talk about it. Yeah, unfortunately, I am too. So I wish you had but had a uh, Catherine Brown, Dr. Catherine Brown, right, right. in uh, at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Uh, I met her in Chicago at a meeting uh, that the American Heart Association had put together with a group of. African American uh, public health researchers and and uh, national pastors, you know, na- you know, nationally known pastors, and we were kind of talking about uh, uh, heart disease in the black community, and we were about to at the end of the meeting, she stood up, and this is to said, how many of you here uh, do not know CPR, and most of the people in the room raised their hands. She said, no one is leaving this room until they learn CPR. And this is the taught everybody CPR. And, you know, you had some of, you know, some of the, you know, famous, well-known uh, pastors down there on their, on their knees doing CPR on the mannequin. And she was like, you're not getting out of this door until you know CPR. And, and she was just so impressive. And um, she walks around in the, in the hood uh, and just like walks up to people and say, do you know CPR? And demonstrate wow. teaches them, people knocks on people's doors and teaches them. And and it's important. It's really important because there, there was a study done by the American Heart Association that showed that if a person was incapacitated and needed CPR and they were in a white neighborhood, 
they were over 33% more likely that there would be somebody nearby that would know what to do. Um, and that it's just something that is very inexpensive to learn, easy to learn, it's cheap to teach it to people, and we should be teaching it in high schools. Yeah. We'll be teaching it in middle schools. You know, Tom, you mentioned, you know, that type of grassroots teaching about health. And I remember growing up in church, and I grew up in a church where uh, it was a Pentecostal, we've always been Pentecostal. And not only that, but we also had highly educated African Americans. We had PhDs in our church uh, and people versus with master degrees and so forth. And we're talking about the 70s and 80s, right? So this was highly unusual. We had nurses in our church. So I remember every fifth Sunday, we would have the nurses would actually have a room and they would come check your blood pressure, uh, if you had questions about your medicine and things about that. And I remember Missionary Barnes, she was a nurse. In, 19, in the early 80s, I want to say 82, 83, she started talking about this new disease called HIV and AIDS, HIV AIDS. And we would have education about what AIDS uh, was and the devastating effects of it. And, you know, as a kid, this was normal to me, right? It was normal for me to see this. But I realized as I got older, a lot of people don't have that advantage where they can go to professionals who look like them, grew up with them, and ask them those, those questions. So, in, you know, from, from your standpoint, from a policy standpoint, how important is it, is it for us to go back to or create a grassroots movement of just educating people about their health, what is healthy, what's not, and eliminating misinformation, as we talked about with vaccines? Yeah, I, I think that absolutely has to happen. Uh, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking um, via the Zoom through a, to a church about this very issue. I mean, we need to be out there doing that. And I think all health professionals need to do whatever they can to educate as many people as possible. Because, you know, we can do a better job of taking care of our health, but me- most of us just don't know what to do. And then there's, and if you just follow what's in the, if you just go by what you see in the media, which is going to be mostly television commercials, try to get you to eat certain things and live certain uh, lifestyles, you're going to be misinformed and um, a lot because there it's the profit motive that's driving that messaging, not not actually your health. So I, I think every health professional, you see, need to use every venue possible, including churches, to reach people. You know, I think that's one of the things that we found with the film is that there actually are a lot of people who are out there and really actively doing things and trying to make a difference. And they don't often get the attention because of the way the media operates in terms of not having time. This is not sexy. This is not controversial. And the profit motive that is behind the media. So it's important to understand that there's a lot of people who are doing things, which means there's a lot of things that people who are listening to us right now can can be active starting tomorrow, starting today in their community if they if they choose to, they can find something to do and get busy. And and I think you'll find that people will come forward and help if you ask them to help. If you give them an opportunity and a, and a, and a way to help, I think you will find that most black health professionals will help. When I reached out to my colleagues, when I reached out to my colleagues in the National Academy of Medicine to say, "Listen, I want to write this. I want to do this this uh, letter, uh, and we want to put it in the New York Times. We want to communicate to our community about COVID 19 I was able to very quickly get 60 of them to come forward and say, sure, I'm willing to sign on to that letter. And it was only 60 because I could only get to 60 people in the amount of time that I had because we didn't have a directory. I know we could have doubled that number if we had more time and reached out to everyone. Since the letter came out, I had received numerous emails from other members saying, how come you didn't ask me? I didn't ask you because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know everybody. But, um, you know, people want to come forward and people want to want to want to use their voice. And, and about that, that article. So I we wrote this, um, I organized, you know, 60 of my colleagues from African-American members of the National Academy of Medicine to support the uh, editorial that, you know, that I wrote for the New York Times uh, was published last week. And, um, um, uh, you know, the one, the one pushback that I got, I did get some, I mean, I got a lot of for it, of course. You know, President Obama tweeted it out and it got a lot of attention from that. But I did get some pushback saying, well, why would you put this in the New York Times? That's not a that's not a, a media that targets the black community. And 
you know, who knows who the National Academy of Medicine is? Why would you, why would that group think that the black community will listen to them? And I want, I did, I did want to respond to that a little bit, if I can use a little bit of your airtime to do that. And say that, you know, first of all, I'm an African-American and I've had a subscription to the New York Times since I was a teenager. So this stereotype that, you know, black people don't read the Times is insulting, quite frankly, to a lot of black people that I know that do read the New York Times. But it was never our intent to reach the general public. Our goal was not so much that we were going to reach the man on the street and the man on the street would say, well, the National Academy of Medicine members said you should do this. I'm going to do it. Our goal was to reach influencers, was to reach those pastors, the, uh, to reach the teachers, reach the, reach the um, you know, policymakers, you know, politicians, people, c- celebrities, athletes entertainers, people that have access to people, people that have a platform, and to show those, to, and to give those people some assurance that, yes, there are African-American scientists that were involved in developing these vaccines, and there are African-American scientists involved in doing the reviews for the federal, uh, for the FDA, and there are African-Americans involved in distributing the vaccine. And then we know what we're talking about. We are a part of the Black community. And we believe that the vaccine is safe and effective and healthy, and that we think that you should listen to people who know what they're talking about, as opposed to listening to other people in the community who may not be as informed. And maybe some of those influencers will now be more comfortable coming forward and recommending that people get vaccinated. But Tom, you got to admit that the man on the street, too, if he hears that there are Black health professionals, scientists at the top organizations that are saying you need to get that vaccine... That's going to combat the information that that man on the street is getting from the anti-vaxxers because the anti-vaxxers are not trying to talk to the pastors. They're trying to talk to directly to people on the street. So the more that you all, as as the top health professionals in our nation, that the man on the street believes doesn't even exist, the more that you all talk directly to that man on the street, especially somebody that you, like you that comes from the hood. I know because I was there with you. And we went back and we filmed and we got a whole lot of love. You got a whole lot of love and you went right back into your hood instincts and was right at home. So you was more at home, back home, than in some of these communities that we've been in where there's not people like us. So when people from our neighborhood see you, as we experience doing the film, they want to hear from you and they vibe with you as more with their own pastor because a lot of the people don't trust the pastor and don't trust a lot of these people that we claim that we think are influencers. Now, All right, somebody now, say now, amen. Somebody will, say that's amen. another show for another day. <laughs> <laughs> that's another show for another day, man. Listen, but <laughs> I want to I, I, I want to commend uh, Tom on that article, and I understand exactly what you're saying. And will I, we do need to go back to that grassroots effort? Uh, but the influencers—that's a very important part of this because a lot of times we see the black is 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 it is important that we let influencers know that there are African Americans at the table, at the in involved in the research, involved in the review, involved in writing of the articles, involved in the in, in, of the approval and the improvement of our healthcare. Because a lot of times what we see, we see non-African Americans, but quote unquote people of color representing the voice of Black people in our country, and more specifically African-Americans. Very rarely you see African-Americans, Black people who had our upbringing, you know, like all, all three of us on this uh, show right now. As a matter of fact, I, I want to give a shout out to President Hrabowski at University of Maryland, uh, UMBC, Baltimore County, and the program that, you know, he runs there, uh, uh, getting kids into STEM, uh, feels because he was recognized and his students were recognized as one of the major researchers on this particular vaccine. You know, so you're talking about kids from our generation who came through these programs that never thought about being an epidemiologist, right? But all of a sudden they get this opportunity and say, hey, I could be an epidemiologist. I could be a person that studied viruses. I could be a person uh, in the lab in a white coat and still be a doctor as opposed to a person treating. And there are, there are other programs out there that do this. Howard University, Car STEM program. Well, 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 Eric, that's too. Tom's homie. No, so no, that's, that's, Tom, that's, is, is, that's Tom's own boy. That's, Tom knows it real well. That's Again, so that's another example 
of somebody who is operating at the highest levels in their career, but also can go right down to the people like Tom can and be absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, come, you know, you guys come out of New York. I come out of Louisiana. Browski comes out of Alabama, but we all have that common thread between us. Exactly. We were raised in black communities, uh, black experiences, black, black parents, uh, and we understand better than anybody else, you know, what our surrounding is. So, again, hats off to you, to, to you Tom, for uh, pushing that envelope. And that's a key and, reason why we've done this show, right, Eric? Because those of us that have all these letters after our degree, after our names, but can still go right down into the community, in the neighborhood, and, and, and treat people as equals. That's one of the things that comes through in the film that I have to say that Tom is the executive producer, did an excellent job. In. You, when you see that film, The Skin You're In, TSYI.org, you're going to see the brothers and sisters in our neighborhood, Brownsville, are also experts sitting side by side with the other trained experts as they talk about their experiences. And that's one of the things that when we showed the film in the neighborhood, went back home and showed that segment of the film because it's a, it's a it's going to be a five part series or more series. One of the things that the people said that our people who grew up knowing us said that they appreciated us showing them as being health experts along with the trained professionals. And it comes through powerfully in the film. And that's something that was Tom's vision. I mean, talk to that, Tom, how did that reaction, how you felt about that? Yeah. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I, I think that they that they are experts. I mean, so everyone. I mean, that was very intentional. We sh the way we lighted people up in, in the shots, the way we framed them on the camera, the way we set, you know set them and you know and, and conducted the interviews. We conducted everybody exactly the same way, so that we've got you know we've got Alvin Poussin, Dr. Alvin Poussin from Harvard Medical School there, and then we've got you know just a guy in the neighborhood who's talking about his experience and he is an expert on his experience. And so we treated him like an expert also. We shot him the same way, we lighted him the same way, we, we used the same types of questions and we um, allow him the opportunity to bring his voice into the, into the film. And I think, I think that's what makes the film effective is that you're hearing the professional expertise, you're hearing the lived expertise and you see the, 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 the consistency in that message and see that the people in the community are also very knowledgeable about the situation that they're living in and why things are as they Tom, as we wrap up, I appreciate you uh, joining uh, a time with uh, Eric and I, releasingclavill.com. You can learn more about the film, The Skin You're In, at tsyi.org. Again, that's tsyi.org. You can also learn more about uh, Dr. Lavise. Any final thoughts uh, regarding this whole issue, the vaccine, health disparities? Well, just uh, I just want to, my parting shot is just to thank you all for uh, having me on this on the show and giving me the opportunity to reach the, the community and talk to the people about the importance of getting vaccinated. We may know, we may not know the long-term effects of being vaccinated, right? We don't know if there'll be some long-term side effect that won't show up for the next five years or something like that. But we do know that there are long-term effects of being infected with COVID. Over 450,000 Americans have been killed. That's more than one out of every thousand American. There's probably not a single African American in this country that doesn't know at least one person that has died from this disease. Yeah. And, and, and in those that have not died, people who have survived it, we're, learning, we're coming to learn, have long-term struggles. They're still having health problems. And those health problems might be lifelong. So the effects of COVID, You've got a you've got a you've got a um, weigh the effects of COVID versus the versus the effects long term effects of the vaccination, and I think if you do that calculation, you have to come to the conclusion that you're better off not taking your risks with getting infected and getting that vaccine as soon as you have an opportunity to get. It. Well, again, Tom, I want to thank you for coming on to this this show and really breaking it down, and that's what we're all about going. Uh, beyond the veil, pulling the curtain back and really talking honestly and earnestly about these issues. So you've heard it from here. And that's it for LaVise and Claville for this particular show. Catch us on our website, uh, lavisaintclaville.com. Catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media. If you have a question, email us at lavisaintclaville at gmail. And until next time, 
be well, and we'll see you again. 